A very late addition to this news update, but the Acolyte is now officially in production, at least according to Star Wars' official Twitter account. Not only that, but all of the casting rumours I've reported on over the last few months are true. The official principal cast has been announced, and we also have our first behind-the-scenes picture. We see Lee jung Je, Leslie Headland, and Amanda Stenberg. And also joining the cast is the fantastic Carrie-Anne Moss. In the official article on StarWars.com, they also confirm in the new plot synopsis, the new leaks. They say a former Padawan reunites with a Jedi Master to investigate a series of crimes, but the forces they confront are more sinister than they ever anticipated. And this is probably referring to the mysterious alien species that were mentioned in the plot leaks. Super exciting stuff, guys. Hello my dear friends, and welcome back to another Star Wars news update. Today we're going to be talking about Andor Episode 10 and the Kenobi series, but we begin with some breaking news for The Bad Batch Season 2. Displates have unveiled some new posters for the upcoming second season that drops in January, and they include the new character designs, some new quotes, and most importantly, a tease for what to expect. Because while Echo was very much sidelined in Season 1, his prominence in these posters suggest he's going to have a bigger, more significant role in Season 2. Echo and Tech both have a lot of their own character posters, individual ones, where they're separated from the other members. I really love these designs, and as you can see, they went with the wanted sign look, as Clone Force 99 are indeed wanted by the Empire. We also get a better look at a slightly older Omega, and something else I find really interesting is that one of the posters shows every member, including Crosshair. Now while it could just be for aesthetic reasons, given Season 1's posters gave away parts of the plot, could this mean that Crosshair's going to be redeemed and rejoin his brothers? If so, this would make him just as much a target of the Empire. And so now, let's take a look at some of these quotes. Omega says, we're on a mission. Echo says, we need backup. Tech exclaims, I know what I'm doing. Wrecker says, leave it to me. And Hunter says, stick to the plan. Really awesome stuff, guys. And with two months to go until the show drops, we are due a second and final trailer. Now, this isn't probably going to be until Andor finishes. And I suspect with the Mandalorian Season 3 final trailer dropping on Christmas Day, we're probably also going to get a second Bad Batch trailer sometime next month. Fingers crossed. And so now, my dear friends, we're now just under two days away from Andor Episode 10, and as such, it's time for our weekly preview. Going into the final episode of the third arc of the season, which is 8, 9, and 10, before the two-episode finale with 11 and 12, is such an exciting prospect, as the show can go in so many different directions. Last week, Diego Luna teased that the remainder of the season does not go the way we think. There are probably going to be some more tragedies, and we're definitely in for some more unexpected twists and turns before the season is out. Now, the biggest question on all of our lips is whether Cassian and Melshi are escaping the prison this week. In my mind, there are two options. Either they're getting out in episode 10, or the big escape is being saved for the finale as a lead into season 2. And the reason I say Cassian and Melshi is because they both survived by the time of Rogue One. And I don't know about you guys, but I've got a feeling that Andy Serkis's character Kino is not going to make it. In episode 9 when Olaf died and the Doctor told them what really happened on level 2, Kino had a realisation that Melshi was right they're never getting out of there, and the Empire's no real intention to let prisoners go once they've served their time. Up until that point, Kino was very defensive of the whole system. He genuinely believed if you keep your head down, serve your time, and follow the rules, you'll be freed at the end, but he doesn't think that anymore. And just before the episode cut to the credits, we visibly saw that change in his eyes, and he answered Cassian's lingering question, how many guards are there on each level? No more than 12. I think in episode 10, we're going to see Cassian and the other members of Table Table 5 try to stage an escape, and I think at first it might go wrong, and there may even be repercussions for them trying to escape, but I have no doubt in my mind that the episode is going to be the setup for the eventual prison breakout, as difficult as it seems for them right now. But a massive point made in episode 9, Nobody's Listening, was that instilling fear in the prisoners is a bigger aim for the staff on Arkina 5 than actually listening to every conversation and watching them 24-7. Cassian has already begun to spot the cracks in the system, and even when he checked into the prison, we saw just how incompetent the staff were. I think Toby Haynes and Tony Gilroy put that in deliberately, and we 
should keep an eye on that going forward. Now aside from Cassian, Dedra Miro's story is fascinating from here on out as well. She's getting ever closer to working out Luthen's identity, or who the ISB refer to as the buyer, or his codename Axis. They interrogated one of Anto Krieger's men, and Dedra's assistant put two and two together that Cassian was probably on Aldani during the heist, based on his description and the fact that he was clean shaven. But Dedra really does have her work cut out for her, and proving it is going to be really hard, as he now goes by Keith and at the time went by Clem, something that neither Bix nor Marva know about, which means torturing them further, which she might do, might prove to be useless. Now I'm starting to think that Cyril is Dedra's only hope going forward, and because he was an eyewitness to the escape of Cassian and Luthen in the first three episodes, I think Dedra's going to call him to Ferex. The actors who play them, Denise Goff and Carl Sola, have teased numerous times that the two characters will be working closer together before the end of the season, and when the uprising on Ferex does eventually happen, we do see Cyril present in the crowd. We saw this in previous TV spots. Now I do worry for Bix and Marva though. Not so much Bix because I think she's been through the worst, but with Marva, she's too frail, old and weak to be tortured and it looks like that's Dedra's last ditch resort. And Marva knows that Cassian took his wealth off world, but she doesn't know her son was involved at Aldani or that he went to Nyamos before being arrested. The only person within Dedra's vicinity who'd be able to identify Cassian and know that he was on Aldani is Sinta and she's staying at a local hotel, I've got a bad feeling she might be called in for questioning somehow. I just hope for her sake and for her girlfriend Vel that she's spared, I really want a happy ever after for them. So moving on, Mon Mothma is being forced by Tay to work with a Chandrillan banker who she calls a thug, but he's her only hope for not drawing suspicion to the withdrawal of large amounts of money. And I think going forward, Perrin is going to keep a close eye on Mon Mothma, but right now, his suspicion is misplaced. He's probably more concerned about her and Tay being lovers than a secret rebellion, and I don't know about you guys, but I've got a feeling Mon Mothma is going to throw Tay under the bus in the upcoming episodes. He's kind of set up to be a scapegoat if anything goes wrong with Mon Mothma and her rebel-related affairs being kept a secret, if of course she gets caught. Now those are just some of my thoughts for now guys, as I say, you never can tell where this series is headed. Three episodes to go, and as I say my dear friends, this is the last one of the three episode arc that started with eight, and episode 10 also has the responsibility of setting up the two-part finale, share your thoughts in the comments down below. And so now, my dear friends, let's talk about the Kenobi series. We've not spoken about this in a very long time, but there's been more controversy behind the scenes as one of the writers has come out and expressed frustration by the show's canon restrictions. Now, within the fandom, and particularly in more recent times, we talk a lot about the importance of canon and sticking to it. In many ways, the Kenobi show tried to adhere to what already existed and reframed or contextualized it, but even with Deborah Chow being careful, many fans still believe that the show broke canon and and added unnecessary hurdles and story arcs in the way of being a prequel to A New Hope. Well, despite fan reception, one of the writers, Andrew Stanton, wanted to go further and not be limited by canon at all, calling canon restrictions frustrating. Now, personally, just speaking as a fan, I'm really glad he wasn't able to do so, because sticking to canon that leads up to A New Hope, the most important Star Wars movie that started everything off back in 77, is crucial. Let's see what he said. Wally and Finding Nemo director Andrew Stanton, who co wrote the final two episodes of Disney Plus's Obi-Wan Kenobi has had some challenges with the restrictions working on the Star Wars series. The two-time Oscar-winning director spoke with Gizmodo and remarks that being tied to established Star Wars canon was a blessing and a curse. This is the quote, that was the blessing and the curse of it. It's like one, you're geeking out that you get to type Vader says this and Kenobi says that. You pause and say, I can't believe I'm actually getting paid to type this. I can't believe these words may be said. But then another part of you it has to go through such a rigorous like, does it fit that canon? And I feel like it's bittersweet. The reason that happens is because people care, but it also kind of doesn't allow sometimes things to venture beyond where maybe they should to tell a better story. So it can sometimes really handicap what I think are better narrative options. Now here's the problem guys. I think if you're being hired to write a Star Wars story, whether you're a writer, a director, a co-writer, whatever it is, George Lucas's story and telling a story that fits in the galaxy far, far away takes precedence. It's simply not the place for self-interjection or selfish creative choices that break the canon. You are at the mercy of the story that needs to be told, and to say that the canon is a hindrance to telling a better Star Wars story, I think, is complete BS. Maybe with the tools and resources they were given, and the whole rewrites process that involve Leia and not Luke, I can sympathise 
size, but they made it hard on themselves, and I don't see how canon is a restriction, you can absolutely be creative within that framing. Yeah, no, it was going to be a story about me and Luke. Yeah, it was always going to be that. And that was one of the genius moments where everyone went, wait a minute, and then changed it. Stanton went on to add that he was sometimes frustrated during the writing process. He also references Andor as being easier to write for, with that show being a quote safe spot in continuity. And so here's what he said, and so I was frustrated at times, not a lot, but I just felt it wasn't as conducive to the story. I love when something like Andor is in a safe spot and it can do whatever the heck it wants, but I felt, you know, Joby, to his credit, kept the torch alive and kept trying to thread the needle so that the story wouldn't suffer and it would please all the people they were trying to keep in the canon, but I got some moments in there that I'm very happy with. I'll just finish by saying this guys, creative freedom and doing what the heck you want in a story is fine. If you're creating new characters, new stories, new eras, and not stepping on the toes of legacy, but when you've got a story like Obi-Wan Kenobi or other legacy characters, you simply can't do that, it's not the place. Especially if you deliberately want to break canon, and to Lucasfilm's credit, there were higher ups who said no to suggestions of just going in with a wrecking ball, so that's interesting. A fascinating article, a lot has come out about the show after the fact. But what do you guys think? Was it a good idea to stick with canon? How do you think they handled Obi-Wan Kenobi? Should they have had more liberty with the canon? Why so or why not? Share your thoughts in the comments down below guys. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give me a big fat thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you in the next video. May the force be with you always.